Now let me introduce, because uh, you know, at the end of the day, we have accidents uh, in the field. Uh, let me introduce uh, Robert Clements uh, from uh, AIB UK on, on the uh, recent helicopter accident. Uh, good afternoon. So my name is uh, Robert Clements. I'm one of the inspectors with the uh, Air Accident Investigation Branch in the uh, UK. I'd like to talk about a, a couple of uh, recent uh, fatal helicopter accidents that uh, I've investigated. Um, they've got a few uh, common themes and hopefully I can link them back to the uh, safety roadmap that was presented this morning and some of the, uh, the uh, items that were listed on there. So, firstly, this is an accident to a, a jet ranger that happened uh, last summer. It's a privately owned uh, jet ranger. The um, pilot was flying it from his uh, house down to uh, a maintenance facility for its uh, annual maintenance check. Uh, the annual maintenance check was due the next day, due to expire the next day, so we had a bit of uh, motivation to, to fly that day, although we could have got an extension if he needed to. Um, it was a flight that would have taken about 25 minutes, a flight he'd done many times before. Um, his, uh, he was a, a private pilot. Um, he'd um, got about 250, just over 250 flying hours, not qualified to fly in instrument conditions, so not qualified to fly in cloud. Um, prior to the accident flight, he hadn't flown for about uh, 77 days, and the previous flight was the same route, but in, uh, in very good weather. And prior to that, he hadn't flown for about uh, seven months. So the weather conditions on the, the day of this, uh, this flight, uh, forecast was for scattered cloud at about 600 feet, broken cloud about 700 feet, visibility three to five kilometers below the cloud. Um, he tried to do the flight first thing in the morning, but then decided um, weather wasn't quite good enough and tried again about uh, lunchtime. So I'll show you what happened. So uh, this is uh, the radar trace. I'll show you a larger view of it in a, a second, but just to give you an idea where we are, hopefully you recognise the, the north of the, the UK there. This is up in uh, North Yorkshire. So if I expand that uh, view out, you can just see on that image where he was trying to get to. So it's just, uh, that's the where he was trying to get to down there. I can't quite point at the screen on that side, I'm sorry. But, uh, so that's an expanded view of the, the radar trace. So he took off from, it, from his home, uh, checked in with the local radar service, um, told him his, his plan routing, um, and about six minutes after he checked into that, to the radar service, he disappeared off the, the radar screen. So you can see on, on the, the graph there the track of the altitude he was flying at. Remember, the cloud base is around six, 700 feet. So initially flying along below the, below the cloud, and then there's, you can see on there, towards the end of the flight, there's two climbs. Um, first one up to over 1,000 feet, um, with the speed dropping back to about 60 knots, and then at the peak of that climb, coming back to about 30 knots, and then a second climb that came back down, and then a second climb. I have a few witnesses who saw that uh, second climb up into cloud. So they describe seeing the helicopter flying along normally, then pitching up dramatically up into cloud and then they could hear it flying around in the cloud for about 30 seconds before it appeared again from the cloud. Came in, as it came out of the cloud, it sort of came into a high hover, um, but then um, went into a bit of a nosedive from which it didn't recover. So that's what we have found when we arrived on the accident site. So that's taken from our, one of our drones. Um, you can see there was quite an intense post-impact uh, fire um, the main, main rotor blades, I don't know if you can see there, right up at the top there, that's where the main rotor blades are, still attached to the mast, um, separated. And I don't know if you can pick out as well, there's a trail going back just down here, you can just about see it, which is where there, you can see one of the retreating blades, a section about a metre long, came off and, and went backwards, ended up quite a long, just off the bottom of that image. So if I show you a slightly larger which is that image, a slightly larger view. So you can see on there that the first impact mark right at the bottom of that image um, was with from the tail rotor. There's quite good crop um, cut marks on the crop. You can see where the tail rotor was spinning and cut the crop, where the, uh, the fin hit the ground. Um, the image you see there, the helicopter's actually inverted, so it's, it hit with the tail first and then went forward and, and ended up upside down. Um, and you can also see the crop cut marks on the crop were from the main rotor, but that was, was spinning with quite high energy as it, as it hit the ground. So our engineers, together with um, Bell, brought all that um, 
wreckage back and looked through it in, in great detail, and they couldn't find anything wrong with the, the helicopter. So they got the engine out from within there and could see, show the engine was running at the time of the impact, running normally, and um, no, no uh, problems with the flight controls. So come to what we, we actually found from this. So we know there was no pre-existing defects with the, uh, the helicopter. Um, I spoke to the... Um, the, uh, helicopter, the air accident, um, sorry, the um, Helimed um, pilot who landed at the scene about uh, 17 minutes after the accident. He said the cloud conditions at the time on the accident site was about 400 feet. Visibility was about 3 to 5k below the cloud. And he was saying he had actually been out flying at another job when he uh, was called to attend this accident scene. If he had been at base when this happened, he probably wouldn't have launched because the weather conditions weren't suitable for him to, to launch from base. So we know the helicopter climbed into cloud. Um, the pilot wasn't qualified to fly IMC. So the, the most likely conclusion from this is it was disorientation in the um, degraded visual environment and then uh, loss of control. So the interesting question from us is, is why did the pilot decide to go flying in these conditions? Why did it make sense to him at the time to, to choose to go flying? Um, and obviously, we can't know for certain because he didn't su survive the accident. But we know. Um, he was taking the helicopter down for maintenance. It was, it was, the maintenance check was due the next day, so that gave him some motivation to go that day. He'd arranged to meet someone when he got there, so again, it gives you another incentive to continue with the flight. Um, he was trying to maintain his recency. and hadn't flown very much for a little while, which is, means he wasn't in practice, but also it gives him an incentive to fly, so he can actually get his recency back. So he had a very busy diary, and if he didn't fly that time, it would be a while before he'd get the chance to fly again. And we also knew it. He tried to fly in the morning and was disappointed that he didn't get to fly in the morning. So when he came back the second time, more determination to go flying. So all those things came together to, 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 to make him think he, it was safe to go on this time. Let's just look at another accident and very similar themes. So this is a, uh, a twin squirrel. Um, again, a privately owned helicopter. Um, being flown from near uh, Cranfield, a private site near Cranfield in the UK, and being flown over to Dublin in Ireland. Uh, pilot was on board with uh, four of his family members, flying over to a family event over in uh, Dublin. Again, the pilot was private pilot, although very experienced, he had over 3,500 flying hours, but not qualified to fly in, uh, in cloud, not, not uh, instrument qualified. Weather conditions for this, so initially around where it took off from, the cloud base was about 1,000 feet, so reasonable weather. But as he got towards um, Wales, flying over the Welsh mountains, the cloud base was down to about 200 feet above sea level. Um, I don't know if you know, any of you know um, Wales, the, the, the hills around there get up to about 3,200 feet. So that's a, a radar trace. The, uh, the red line you can see is the radar trace from the helicopter. The blue line is the planned, planned route. So say the, uh, the, uh, over the, the Welsh hills there on that route, you'd need to be, to be clear of all the terrain. You'd need to be about 3,200 feet. So a, a normal um, IFR MSA would be up at um, 4,300, something around that, that sort of number. Um, initially, the, the helicopter was flying at about 1,000 feet to stay below the cloud. And as he got towards Wales, he climbed up to about 2,500 feet, but then to stay out of the cloud, descended back down again to about uh, 2,000 feet. And unfortunately, that's where it struck one of the hills. So that's where it uh, hit the hill. Um, that hill there is up to about uh, 2,300 feet, and it was the helicopter hit the bottom of that hill about 300 feet below the peak. Uh, the radar showed there was no attempt to turn before it hit there. No, it had, the helicopter hadn't slowed down at all, and it went straight into the hill. So we believe it was actually still in cloud when it hit the hill. That's a picture of where it was taken when we, we got up to the accident site to give you an idea of the, the conditions up on the top of the hill. Um, the helicopter was spread over about 100 meters across the, uh, the ground there. So we know it was traveling at quite high speed with a lot of energy as it hit the ground. Again, the engineers looked through all the, um, the wreckage there and couldn't find anything wrong with the helicopter. So again, similar, similar things, no pre-existing defects with the helicopter. Um, actual weather there, the cloud base was down at around two to 400 feet above sea level with an MSA up at 4,000 feet. 
Um, we have one witness saw the helicopter very briefly through a gap in the cloud that knew it was flying up, up in the cloud level, but the pilot wasn't, um, wasn't qualified to fly in IMC. So similar conclusions, likely disorientation in the degraded visual environment ending up in controlled flight into terrain. So again, interesting question, why did, the, why did it make sense for that pilot to choose to go flying on that day? And similar reasons, he made a family commitment to take his family to, over, to, over to this family event. And there was also some evidence that he'd flown in these sort of conditions before, which, and, and, and it all worked out fine previously. So there's some common features here. Um, private pilot without instrument qualification, flying in challenging weather conditions. Um, both flights were complying with the legal minimum until they entered cloud. Um, I'm sure many of you know other accidents. There's many like this out there. There's lots of similar accidents out there. Lots of research and reports about the challenge of, um, of flying helicopters in, in poor weather. But yet these accidents still continue to happen. So perhaps um, my thoughts on how we might be able to prevent some of these and linking back to the, uh, uh, the safety map that was presented the, um, this morning. Um, when I'm not investigating accidents, I um, fly for an airline flying the um, 777, and I had the pleasure of doing my uh, six-monthly SIM check this weekend. Um, and during that, that SIM check, nearly all, all the discussion is all about decision-making. It's about situational awareness. It's about um, team working. Um, very little technical discussion anymore. That's, that's almost taken as a given that you can fly the aircraft safely. It's all about how, you, how we work together and how we're making effective decisions. When I, I last did my last um, helicopter typewriting check, it's, it's still very much just a test of can I fly an auto rotation? Can I land in a confined area? That discussion of decision making isn't really there at the moment. And hopefully that links to some of the stuff that's in the um, safety roadmap that we were talking about this morning of um, less checking and more training and promotion of some of this um, safety material. I think it would be really good if possible to, to use some of these accidents um, to present them to, to pilots when they come up for their um, type rating to actually uh, understand what, what's happened to other people and take some of the lessons away from this. It might be a real opportunity to, to, um, to get the message out to pilots. So that's all from me. Do you have questions separately? Thank you.